thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen. Um, my name is Vilge. I have uh, very recently graduated from Ankara University, my, my PhD studies. And the article that I will present today is titled as um, Reflections of Social Justice from a Broca Mirage. And uh, this article analyzes the demand for social justice in street protests in Iraq, in Malaysia, and France by using the metaphor of social justice as a broca mirage. Uh, let me first explain a little bit the background of my, my uh, research, how I um, uh, started to, uh, uh, or how I um, um, started this research. Actually, as you may know, that the year of 2019 has uh, declared as a year of street protests, and the people from uh, more than 15 countries uh, were declaring that they have been facing various types of precariousness, insecurity, inequality, and uh, unfairness. And the individuals have lost the uh, control of their future. Um, so the people were basically criticizing and were, were criticizing in the streets that, and also were declaring that the credibility and the legitimacy of the idea that economic developments will bring wealth for all have been lost. So while all these inequalities have been spreading around, um, the people expressed their demands for change, uh, focusing on social justice and equality. And they overflow to the streets in several parts of Eurasia uh, by basically criticizing the priorities of specific groups, corruption, unemployment, and unfair working conditions. And also they were uh, demanding economic justice. Actually, this, these demands were uh, more visible during COVID-19 crisis, but it was um, um, started before. So, basing on these facts, uh, I want to, to reflect voices of the people regarding their perception on ideal life, social justice, in the protests of Iraq, Indonesia, and France. Uh, they are totally different countries. In a minute, I will explain why I selected uh, these uh, totally different three countries. And another objective of this research is to enlighten what kind of conception of social justice can best explain and reflect the perception of social justice in these countries because there are lots of explanations about what the social justice is. Uh, so my aim was uh, to search which one fits better in order to understand today's perception on social justice. And I applied most uh, different systems design. Um, uh, Iraq, Indonesia, and France are totally different uh, between each other, uh, from each other uh, with respect to geography, historical background, political structures, economic development, culture, and religion. And I wanted to see if there is a common point on the demand of social justice. And I follow two steps in this research. First, the conceptualization of social justice. Uh, I mean the theoretical framework drawn on the concept of social justice. And then I analyze the posters uh, in the street protests used in Iraq, Indonesia, and France. Uh, so let's start first the conceptualization of social justice. I will try to be very brief. Um, this is the explanation of what the social justice is, according to several theorists. First, utilitarianism focused on the benefit of the greater number of people in order to sustain social justice in the society. So if the most advantageous ones get benefit and the others sustain their position, the action is considered as fair. Um, and the, uh, the contractarian uh, understanding um, criticize utilitarianism and the disregard of particular individual cases because for them individuals are ends in themselves and uh, they focus on the equal rights of individuals and inequalities for them can be acceptable only if they benefit to the disadvantaged ones but they mainly um, um, analyze on the perfect justice utopian one and then equalitarian understanding of, of social justice we can um, um, put Amartya Sand working and Nussbaum here, that they um, uh, do not want to deal with the perfect solutions, but they want to focus on the problems of real society, real uh, current society. And they also question the equality of what? Um, because people are considered as equals, but according to their thought, according to their appearance, according to their hopes. So they uh, emphasize on uh, at last equality of capabilities to eliminate existing inequalities because according to them uh, talents may make people more advantaged so there should be a compensation equalization mechanism and then um, libertarian understanding um, focus more on the individual liberties and for, for them the role of state should be minimal any attempt uh, of states um, to redistribute 
for example, the distribution of uh, um, resources, um, any attempt of uh, tax mechanism, social insurance mechanisms is considered as infringement of liberties because for them individuals uh, just can decide by themselves what to have, what to share, so they don't want to intervene in the redistribution mechanisms. And in this uh, understanding, Hayek, for example, says that social justice is an illusionary goal, meaningless, self-contradictory religious. And he sees um, social justice as a mirror. So my metaphor, uh, social justice is a block of mirror, comes here. So let's imagine that social justice is a mirror. And I argue that a conception focuses on only individuals, individualization, personalization of systematic problems, and treating people as separate bodies. Um, break the idea of social justice because social loses its meaning. What is social? Um, a concept or a policy becomes social as much as it reduces the risks of self-regulating market on the society, not even on individuals. So social also is related with the community. So with this individualism-based lenses, Hayek perceives social justice as a marriage because he tries to look at it from broken mirror. And I also argue that market driven explanations reflect the social justice from broken leader. So we need something else to uh, express uh, social justice. And here comes the confrontation to market driven conception. These theories, uh, theoricians basically criticize not questioning the structures and institutionalized inequalities on decision making processes. And for them, before any discussion to how to distribute and what to distribute, there should be a discussion on how the differences of social groups are institutionally structured. And for them, the focus should be the elimination of institutionalized domination and oppression. And they mentioned about five categories of oppression, exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. So uh, before going through the analysis of posters, um, I draw this um, table in order to categorize better the, um, the, 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 the poster. So when the posters express or when the people demand, people's demand express the elimination of institutionalized oppression, it is categorized as confrontation uh, to market, um, market driven uh, conception. Uh, so what I have analyzed as a poster is uh, that uh, first I focus on the street protest during 2019 and 2020. Uh, in Iraq and Indonesia, and during late uh, 2018 and 2019 in France, and the ones that indicate the perception of ideal society. And why selecting the posters needs posted in international websites in English and also national news sites are considered. And besides posters headed in news, in case of Iraq, the photo of four famous photographers, photographers were used, and two Iraqi people provided intellectual support and translation services for this research. And I'd like to thank for, uh, for them, for their um, wonderful support, because without their support, it, this research would not be possible. And in case of Indonesia, again, one Indonesian person and one journalist uh, provided intellectual support and translation services for this research. So let's start with the most difficult part, the uh, Iraqi um, protests. Actually, um, in each uh, country, um, maybe we need a, a whole presentation, so I will try to um, be very brief and talk about the very basics about uh, these protests. Um, in 1st October 2019, the Iraqi people organized in social media and they took the streets uh, protesting corruption, unemployment and inefficient public services. But they were also criticizing the sectarianism in the, in, in the country, divided society based on sects and also chronic lack of basic services and also the case of ISIS. Um, as we know, uh, ISIS entered into Iraq in 2014 and took some northern cities and then um, Iraqi army took again in 2018 uh, these cities, but all the um, civilian people were suffering uh, meanwhile. And there, is, um, there was also a rising unemployment. So people um, expressed their demands in the streets um, about uh, overall change of political system with revolution. And they uh, also want to eliminate privileges um, and also stop uh, killing peaceful protesters because during the uh, protest, more than 500 people uh, um, were killed. Actually, this is the um, officially announced number, and hundreds of people um, injured and hospitalized. So let's see the posters now. Um, in, in the first one, um, it says Revolt of the Oppressed Generation. 
Our childhood invasion of Kuwait, our adolescence war with Iran and unfair invasion of Iraq by US, our youth bombing, sectarianism and ISIS. We ask for our rights, we want country for people, protest generation with all injustices. And in the second one, it says, can you give me some of your privileges of three members of presidential council to feed my children? Cause you let hunger feed them, stop to this injustice. And in the first one, this uh, boy says, I'm a, I'm a story of women in a country where the humanity is lost. And um, another uh, woman says, get back Safiya Sarah, we will go back to our homes. Safiya Sarah is a graduate engineer uh, who, who was killed during the protest. Um, so we can see here the, um, that they are criticizing the overall oppression and also demanding overall change. Um, and this woman says the only emancipation from the corruption is getting rid of sectarian system. And in the second poster, it says, consider me as a protester, not as a Shia. So the people are exhausted to be considered uh, as um, their sects. Um, so um, they want, again, the, the overall change. We can meet that. And then when I come to the Indonesia. Um, I should give very brief information about uh, Indonesian uh, past. It was a colony of Netherlands and G Japanese invasion uh, during uh, Second World War ended Dutch rule. And the nationalist leaders uh, declared independence uh, in 1949. But there were opposing powers of military, uh, political Islam, and the Communist Party. Uh, so the tension between military and Communist Party resulted in a coup d'etat. And afterwards, this, after, after this coup d'etat, there was an uh, authoritarian political system in Indonesia. And then uh, it brought out uh, the popular discontent with new uh, orders, corruption, and suppression of political oppression. Uh, so again, student-led uh, protesters um, wanted to change the system in 1998 with the revolution. And afterwards, the biggest civil uh, unrest happened in 2019 in Indonesia uh, because the uh, recently elected government um, wanted to change the anti-corruption agency. And also there were some amendments of lay, uh, law changes. Um, so uh, people again took the streets and it, uh, it, it took several months uh, to, uh, for, for this um, protest. And what they want basically is the uh, rejection of this, this law of anti-corruption agencies decrease uh, I mean government was um, I think I said uh, wanted to reduce the power of uh, anti-corruption agencies so people were against that and also stop militarism in Papua. Papua was one of uh, the important region in, uh, in Indonesia and there were uh, lots of humanitarian violation cases there so people um, uh, were um, uh, eager to stop that. So first, um, the poster says, let only law be blind, not elites, and reform era is being corrupted. Um, the, um, they, they, don't, they are not happy with the reform era because they think that it's uh, corrupted. So they want, again, the overall change. And then in the second one, kids become leaders. Then the leaders become kids. Um, change is coming, uh, she says. And again, and also the yellow one to the nearest order. So they also are not happy with the current order and they uh, are requesting to change it. Um, in the first poster, we see the uh, president um, like a liar. And also it happened in the uh, French case uh, because Macron was um, very much declared as liar. Um, and also in Indonesia, people were protesting against labor laws. Um, because the government wanted Indonesia to be more attractive for the investment, but it affected labor. And then people took the streets again in, uh, beginning from 2019 and then 2020 it continued. And it's not a poster, but I think the uh, eyes of these uh, two women are expressing um, everything that uh, anger and worriedness. Um, and then I come to the French case. Actually, this one uh, we know um, better because it was more popular, let's say. Um, the people organized again in social media and uh, they were protesting basically rising fuel prices and high cost of living and they declared uh, official charts and their demands are focused on zero homeless, more progressive income tax, maximum salary fixed at 15,000 euros, the big payback, small pay small, end of austerity policy, 
and also Ashton seekers should be well treated and the un unsuccessful Ashton seekers should be should not return to their uh, country of origin so this uh, were the case and then um, in the first image um, it is from um, uh, Paris street uh, the street artist Pascal Boyard uh, painted um, the famous painting Liberty Leading the People from uh, July Revolution in 1830 but the people put um, yellow vest so it seems that um, it's again kind of revolution for them and in the second one uh, it says yellow is the new block actually in today's morning sessions there was also discussion about new blocks in international politics but I think people think differently and they say like the demand is another block and in the um, first um, poster it says look at your Rolex it's time to forge gold and in the second one the class struggle is dressed in yellow um, in this one, dismissal, Macron dismissal, government resignation, system evolution. And in the second one, revolt, social justice. So we see that, again, there are some problems about overall system and they are expressing it. Urgent, um, in the first post, post, it says urgent, purchase power, dignity for all. In the second, is it revolt, no Macron, it's revolution. And also, I want to underline... Sorry, five, five minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and people were expressing their emotions during the uh, during the protest. For example, in Iraq, um, it is written here that despite a year of tension, I will I still dream about you. So people were expressing or, or sending their love messages. So I think it's important that human with emotions, not only economic interests, were also visible in the streets. Um, and in, and in Indonesia, there, there was also a law change uh, regarding. Uh, punish, um, punishment of extramarital sex. So this girl um, uh, was saying that I don't need sex, the government is fucking me right now. And uh, that actually the protest is in itself is a kind of act of, um, of solidarity, but there are lots of solidarity um, within countries, like families were in the, in, in the protest, people were giving free services, and also the, in, in Iraq, for example, they were not going home, so they were, the, the people were preparing food and providing medical services because of violent police acts. And in Indonesia, um, there is one musician um, um, declared a, a global funding to uh, provide food for the protesters, and there were again lots of digital campaigns. And also there is a solidarity between country and also between the protesters in the world in 2019. We can see different countries with the similar symbols of the resistance from movies and, and, and all to other stuff. So to conclude, um, I think the struggle for freedom, liberties, religion or nation seems to be replaced uh, with the struggle for social change and it seems that it's global. And this struggle is leaderless, horizontally happening, and these people have no affiliation to any political party, trade union, or any existing actor in the system, because it seems that they don't want to negotiate with the existing authorities. It uh, expresses that the demands are for radical change. And hundreds of people killed, thousands arrested, injured, and hospitalized, but the people continue protesting in, in, in solidarity. So we can say that common demand is to eliminate institutionalized oppression, rule out all types of privilege, and uh, sustain economic justice and equality. So from my understanding and to my eyes, the demands resemble more confrontation to the market-driven conception of uh, social justice. Thank you for your attention and sorry if I took so much time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Feliz. I apologize for referring to you earlier as Miss Feliz. You do deserve your title. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. You did not go over time. It is perfect. Uh, it was really interesting. I really like the broken mirror metaphor. I think it can also reflect the dichotomy of the ideal versus uh, reality, but we'll discuss that later. Uh, so unfortunately, Dr. Damirka Mihail Jevic, I'm sorry if I cannot pronounce uh, names that are not Portuguese, I do apologize, um, from the University of Mostar in Bosnia and Herzegovina was scheduled to present a paper uh, today on the role of civil society and political changes on the 21st century, and she will not be participating, unfortunately, uh, in this session. So our second presenter uh, is then Dr. Rashid 
Kaudhuri from the Manisa Selal uh, Bayar University in Turkey. Again, I apologize deeply for the mispronunciations, um, uh, and, but I do so uh, with respect and I am willing to be taught how to pronounce correctly. Um, so Dr. Rashid will uh, address the pitfalls of integration, narrowing room for maneuver of the Lukashenko regime in Belarus. So Dr. Chaudhuri, you may begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Ribeiro, um, and thank you to the organizers of, of, of both this panel and this conference. Um, so, uh, my name is Rashid Chaudhuri, uh, and um, I uh, work at the uh, Department of Political Science and International Relations at Manisa Jalal Bayar University in, in Turkey. Uh, but I am originally from Belarus. That's not obvious from my appearance or from my name. Uh, my name you know, comes through my father, who's from Bangladesh, but, but I myself was born in Belarus and I'm a Belarusian citizen. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, what I'll be presenting today, uh, you know, stems not just from academic research, but also from the sort of common knowledge that, you know, people uh, in Belarus or, or Belarusians in general have that perhaps may not be as obvious to people looking at the situation from outside. I should also like to point out actually that um, when I submitted my proposal uh, for this panel, it was still March, right? And we were several months away from the election that took place in August, which completely changed the situation uh, in Belarus beyond what anybody could imagine uh, previously uh, happening because protests of the size that are happening in Belarus right now um, are unprecedented in, in modern Belarusian history. Uh, even at the time of the protests leading up to Belarusian independence, at the, at the sort of historical uh, period of 1989 to 91, when the Soviet Union was in the process of breaking up, didn't involve 300,000 people marching through the streets of Minsk. Uh, there were protests calling for the impeachment of the current president, Alexander Lukashenko, in 1996. They too were uh, significantly smaller uh, than the ones um, we're seeing right now. So it, it really is a historical moment. And I will be addressing it in my presentation, uh, but my presentation isn't mainly geared towards covering the protest simply because I had planned it out earlier. Uh, nevertheless, the situation that I will be uh, describing in, my, uh, in the rest of my presentation is being exacerbated by the current uh, events. Uh, and and the, the, the corner that Lukashenko has sort of painted himself into is becoming ever not narrower as a result of um, the demands of, of large segments of the population for uh, significant change. So I will try to uh, share my uh, screen with you now. Um, So underneath you have the green, right. exactly, perfect. Uh, uh, okay, and uh, I will go to, right. So uh, what I will be, uh, while it loads, I will, I will uh, just introduce the rest of my, uh, of, uh, my talk. Um, what I will be focusing on is uh, the so-called union state between Belarus and Russia. This is something that was negotiated in the 90s uh, and to some extent, or to a large extent, it remained on the rhetorical plane rather than uh, the practical one until very recently. Um, and um, uh, the Russian government, uh, actually under the previous prime minister, uh, Medvedev, uh, before Mishustin came in, uh, was directed by President Putin to try to force Belarus, essentially, into making it a more real sort of union between the two countries. Uh, which is specifically what was reducing, uh, reducing uh, the room for maneuver that Lukashenko has, which I referred to in my title. So to go back to the beginning of, of the story, the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, as you all know, and the breakup essentially happened in Belarus. The Speaker of the Belarusian Parliament at the time, Stanislav Shushkevich, invited uh, the presidents of Ukraine and Russia, Kravchuk and Yeltsin, to Belarus in December 1991, uh, and then as, the, as three of the four founding members of the Soviet Union, these three republics uh, gave themselves the right and privilege to dissolve the Soviet Union by a treaty among the three of them. And that is what they uh, proceeded to do. Uh, Gorbachev, the Soviet president at the time, had to accept this as a fait accompli. 
and then the Soviet flag on the Kremlin was uh, replaced by the Russian one um, on the 25th of December 1991. Between 91 and 94, Belarus was in the process of uh, framing a constitution, uh, and then in 94, under this new constitution, the first presidential election was held. Uh, what what Belarus what the political elites of Belarus had planned out was a fairly strongly presidential system, not nearly as strong as today, but nevertheless a democratic one. Uh, the presidential elections of, of 1994 are considered to be the only democratic presidential elections that have been held, or the only free and fair elections that have been held in, in, in Belarus so far. Um, and uh, Lukashenko, a, a relative upstart, only 39 years old at the time, won um, this election uh, despite the state actually favoring the second candidate that you can see to his right, uh, Vyacheslav Kebich, who was the prime minister of Belarus at the time. Um, Lukashenko worked towards political and economic integration with Russia. He got it uh, vetted by the people in 1995 through a referendum where people were asked whether they support his policy of economic integration with Russia. We didn't uh, mention the political component at all. Um, and uh, whatever we think of, of the honesty of the counting of the results, more or less, uh, there was support among the Belarusian public for integration with Russia because uh, there was still a lot of nostalgia for the Soviet Union that had just broken up four years before the 95 referendum. Um, and uh, the economy of Belarus was really not doing well. The, the, the growth rate was in, in not simply in negative territory, but there was a severe recession. It was about minus 10% of a contracted year. Um, and, and the thought was that economic integration with Russia would help solve some of these problems that Belarus found itself uh, facing. Um, so uh, then rather than sort of starting a course for the West and eventual membership in the EU as the, as the democratic uh, neighbors of Belarus, namely Poland and Latvia and Lithuania were doing at this time, Belarus sort of took a turn in the, in the opposite direction, which was fitting with both Lukashenko's outlook and the, the outlook of a large part of his electorate as well, who tended to be more conservative, older, and so on. He signed uh, an agreement creating the so-called Community of Belarus in Russia, it's a com commemorative coin uh, to mark the occasion. Then in 97, he upgraded it to, um, from the community to the Union of Belarus in Russia. And in 98, he proceeded to upgrade it to the so-called Union State of Belarus in Russia. Now, the, union for, the formation of the Union State in 1998 does not mean that Belarus gave up its independence although Russia wanted it to, but it does not mean that. Uh, it remains a sovereign state, and it does not mean that Russia certainly gave up its independence either. The two states did not merge into a new state. Rather, this was a union of states that it also calls itself a state. In other words, it tried to jump. So taking the analogy of the European Union, which uh, at the time was involved in, in, in negotiating a new constitution for the EU that never actually happened, uh, because some states did not agree on it, there was this idea that the federalization of, of the EU would increase to the point where it would start acting more like a state. And of course, it does have some state institutions like the European Parliament and so on. The idea was to take that as a model, but not then proceed to join the EU, but rather between within uh, the two of these uh, countries, Belarus and, and Russia, to form an ever closer union between them that would have some of the characteristics of, the state, of a state, some of the institutions of a state, but without either of the existing two states giving up their uh, sovereignty. And here you find Lukashenko and Yeltsin. Yeltsin, of course, being one of the three signatories who broke up the Soviet Union. Now he's forming the Union uh, in 1997, which then would become a Union state. This chart, it's in Russian, but I will quickly summarize it. It talks about the different degrees of integration in the former Soviet space. So you have the Commonwealth of Independent States as the outer layer. Within that, some of the states are members of the collective uh, security agreement. Within that, you have the Eurasian Economic Union, which is actually the brainchild of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. But Nazarbayev was not willing to go further than that and, and make Kazakhstan be part of some sort of union state, even if it is a state in name. So he stopped at the Eurasian Economic Union. But Lukashenko wanted to go further. And he wanted to go further in, uh, in for two main reasons. One is it allowed Belarus access to much lower oil and gas prices than the ones prevalent on the world market. And of course, Belarus is heavily dependent and its industry, its electricity generation and so on are heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas. Uh, to give you a simple example, one of the main exports of Belarus is um, uh, nitrate fertilizer. 
uh, and this is, is manufactured using Russian hydrocarbon uh, inputs. Um, now, what Lukashenko was never able to achieve was his dream of getting Belarus to be able to buy those products uh, from Russia at, at Russian internal domestic rates, but nevertheless, what he did get was rates below uh, world market rates. Um, for, and in terms of his personal potential benefit from this agreement, what Lukashenko was interested in potentially uh, was the position of the president of this union between Belarus and Russia. Of course, this position of, of, of common president was never actually implemented, but it was there in the agreement. And Lukashenko figured at the time in the, in the late 90s that he could outmaneuver Yeltsin, who seemed to be weak. He was in weakening health. He was sometimes seen publicly drunk and so on. Lukashenko was sort of young and bigger, so he's considered himself to be so. Uh, but then once Putin came to power in Russia, those plans, um, you know, uh, could not be implemented. Um, so then what Lukashenko did is he stalled the integration with Russia. He continued to, or the Belarusian economy under his rule, continued to enjoy the low oil and gas rates. This allowed Lukashenko to uh, oversee a period of uh, sometimes quite substantial economic growth. So he's been in power for 26 years, which is, which is um, certainly uh, uh, close to a record by European standards, if not, if not the actual record. Um, but within these 26 years, um, four of the years, there's been double digit economic growth. And the average has been 4% a year. Uh, quite often, Belarus has outperformed Russia, which is Belarus's main uh, trading partner. Um, about 39% of Belarus's external trade is with Russia, and about 30% uh, is uh, with the EU. Uh, the problems began uh, when, for both Belarus and Russia, um, when Russia intervened in uh, Ukraine following protests there uh, and the next Crimea. At this point, Russia faced economic sanctions from the EU. Lukashenko actually in this situation supported Ukraine much more than he did Russia. Uh, he has, okay, thank you. Uh, as much as uh, the members of the Belarusian opposition, Lukashenko himself as well was afraid of a potential Russian intervention in Belarus once he saw what happened, what had happened in Ukraine. Um, his position, not outwardly arguing with, with Putin while supporting Ukraine, allowed Belarus to be a platform for negotiations between the Russians and the, and the Ukrainians with the help of the, of the Europeans, with the, of the German and the French, as you can see in this picture. Um, but the effect of this crisis was that the Russian economy went into recession. Since Russia is the main uh, purchaser of Belarusian-made products, the Belarusian economy followed the Russian economy into recession. And uh, Russia took a long while coming out of this recession as a result of the continued European sanctions. Belarus was not placed under these sanctions, but it nevertheless suffered the results along with Russia. Uh, now, fast forward to 2019, the Russian budget uh, was facing severe strain uh, due to these sanctions, due to the necessity to carry Crimea uh, and, and so on, and weak economic growth. Uh, and they were no longer willing to subsidize Belarus quite to the same tune and raise the oil prices last year to, for Belarus to world levels. And so this cartoon published by Deutsche Welle uh, says Belarusian, addressing Lukashenko, uh, come here and surrender and we will give you a barrel of oil. Because what Putin said is that if we actually fully implement all of the agreements of the Union State from the 90s, that we'll have a shared currency, which will be the Russian ruble, that we'll have a shared government, a shared parliament, and a shared president. If we do all of that, I will make you, Lukashenko, the speaker of the common parliament, and you can enjoy domestic Russian rates for oil. Otherwise, start paying global rates, at which point the United States tried to come in and help in February before the global shutdowns hit in, in, in March because of the pandemic. Um, and now the US is actually exporting oil to Belarus through uh, Latvia. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Norway have joined in and are exporting oil to Belarus. Nevertheless, three quarters of the Belarusian oil supply comes from Russia. Now you have the wild card. 100,000 people marching in the streets of Minsk for the last six weeks, uh, for the last six Sundays, uh, with smaller demonstrations every day uh, of the week going on as well, demanding instant, immediate change, demanding that Lukashenko resign. Uh, because of the uh, very dubious election that was held in August. And the EU was going to, of course, place Lukashenko under sanctions to 
pressure him into resigning. Now, uh, Cyprus actually prevented that because Cyprus wants to see sanctions against Turkey implemented. Uh, the result of this situation uh, is that Lukashenko is being pushed further into Russia's embrace, but Russia is not now any longer fully willing to embrace him as much as it was before August. Uh, Putin has given uh, Lukashenko uh, one and a uh, one and a half billion dollar uh, loan, which is not a large amount, and has actually asked Lukashenko to uh, modify the Belarusian constitution and take steps towards resigning, if not now, then within the observable future. Uh, and, and thus it is that Lukashenko has been left essentially without any significant allies um, uh, and, and, and finds himself in a very difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chowdhury, uh, for your presentation on this very current and pressing, pressing issue and especially for being careful enough to incorporate the most recent developments uh, in your presentation. That's uh, very useful. Uh, so our third speaker is Ms. Anna Uilaki. Uh, please correct me if it's doctor already or not, because I'm not, uh, unsure. Not already. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Uh, so Ms. Anna Uilaki from the Corvinus University of Budapest in Hungary will present a paper on a Republican theory of migration. Go ahead, you have the floor. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm very, very thankful uh, for being here and share my ideas with you, especially because, uh, because I am uh, in my last year or hopefully my last year in my PhD. So, so I will uh, be very thankful for any uh, comments and ideas on, on the topic. Um, Just a second. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the the initial idea of of this research uh, is based on the previous idea of mine that something is is wrong with the current uh, mainstream debates uh, on the topic of migration. So in the presentation first, I will. I will outline how the topic of migration emerges in contemporary political theory. So I attempt to justify the need of an alternative approach. Then I, I sketch the foundations of Republican political theory. And finally, I will identify four elements that make Republican political theory a promising approach to, un uh, to understand and address migration. I would like to start with a possibly surprising statement, which is that movement and uh, mobility is an inherent part of human life. Why is it surprising, you could ask? Uh, I think because, because we hear a lot uh, about migration from the public, but it is always framed as something like a problem, an anomaly, uh, something involving a tragedy, or, or posing a threat to other people. So uh, regardless it is good or bad, human history has always been driven by human move movement. A uh, more interesting fact is that political theory has not been successful in ba balancing public opinion with precise and comprehensive approaches. Liter literature in, uh, on political theory of migration is largely engaged with the question of immigration restrictions. I believe that it is inevitable to understand migration in its more complex form because that is what that's what uh, scientific prestige require and because it is necessary for for political science to offer some practical guidance on the most challenging issues of the era. Uh, in contemporary political theory the topic of migration usually appears in its re re reduced form and as a ma marginal question. Uh, several presuppositions around migration are too simplistic. For example, analyses tend to regard societies as autonomous and separated from one another. And it is also usual to assign a homogeneous culture and a fixed membership to political community. A uh, further problem is that political theories tend to, uh, tend to form a dichotomy between phenomena belonging exclusively 
to the domestic world or to the international world. And from this perspective, migrants appear as an anomaly of the system, being somewhere in the gray zone or, or at the edge of the political community uh, that neither belongs solely to the inside or the outside world. And from this, this perspective, that applies the illusion of immobility, movement will mean a pathology for, for researchers. A possible reason for these oversimplified pres presumptions is, is, was, is that with the publication of Joseph Kerensky's influential article, Aliens and Citizens, uh, some of you may, may know this, uh, this article, the emerging subfield of political theory of migration has been preoccupied with the prob problem whether states, more precisely liberal democracies, should or should not open their borders in front of immigrants. So the open versus closed borders debate is so influential that even latest normative uh, literature on, on, on migration is actually about immigration. The assumptions criti criticized by authors from an inter interdisciplinary perspective are summarized as uh, methodolo methodological nationalism. Critics note several errors of methodological nationalist thinking. For example, the already mentioned bias towards the dichotomy between the inside and the outside world, where nations are separated from the international world by fixed borders, and border controls are brought off exactly at the territorial border of a state and, and at the exact moment of entrance. These implicit assumptions make it impossible to think systematically about uh, global phenomena, complex relationships and injustices that persons, uh, especially persons on the move, suffer from. So I will, I will demonstrate how, why, um, how could politi uh, Republican political theory offer a promising tool set for eliminating these, these, these deficiencies of, of the mainstream literature. The contemporary uh, Republican political, political theory emerged in the last couple of decades as a renaissance of the Republican tradition, uh, but the most referred systematic work is elaborated by Philip Pettit. At the center of Pettit's civic republicanism or neo-republicanism, there is a particular notion of freedom that is freedom as non-domination. This kind of liberty is a status where the individual enjo enjoys immunity from the arbitrary power of others. Pettit uh, sees the main difference between republicanism and uh, liberalism in this conception of freedom because he identifies the liberal notion of freedom as freedom uh, from interference. While for liberalism, active, uh, active interference means the restric restriction of one's freedom, for republicanism, even the possibility of arbitrary interference means unfreedom. So according to Pettit, for a relationship of domination, three criteria have, have to be met. First, the no dominating person has to have the possibility to interfere. Second, the potential interference has to be arbitrary. And finally, the interference has to be aimed at one of those choice alternatives, which play central role in the, in the life of the dominated person. So the typical examples for domination are the master-slave relationship, the husband-wife relationship in a patriarchal marriage, and the employer-employee relationship. The, the case of the slave is the best illustration of how a relatively free slave of, uh, of a benevolent ma master is still dominated, still unfree, since the master can anytime change his conduct arbitrarily and he can interfere in the life of the slave. So that was the, I think that that's the most important part of Republicanism from the from perspective, if, if we want to um, understand mi migration too. So the four advantages advantages of uh, republicanism. 
uh, are are those that you can see. The first one is is what I already talked about. So opposed to the liberal notion of freedom, uh, republicanism considers a broader spectrum of interpers interpersonal relations as non-freedom. Therefore, it considers several relationships as oppressive or uh, unjust, against which the li liberal ideal of freedom is merely blind. Hence, in my view, from the Republican perspective, it is self-evident to ask whether freedom is realized not only in the domestic sphere, but also in the global transnational world. It means that freedom becomes a fundamental problem, not only from the view viewpoint of admitting state and immigrants, but also becomes a central, pro uh, central for the problem of emigration, refuge or, or internet, international organizations. The, the Republican notion of freedom at the same time is uh, narrower than the liberal notion. For, for Pettit, not all active interference counts as dominating. That means that, for example, law does not dominate. Uh, moreover, it, law is the key for individual liberty. So with a Republican eye, we become able to realize how enormous the discretionary right of the modern state in the identification of who, uh, who at all deserves to be under the jurisdiction of the state. The others are, are merely excluded from the jurisdiction by immigration restrictions or by the isolation and deportation of people considered illegal. These persons are extremely dependent on their employees, landlords, or even human tra traffickers. So moreover, from, from the terrorist attacks of September 11, it is a common practice to deprive people from their rights and dehumanize them and to lock them in institutions to which law cannot really reach out, like in Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib. Although these are extreme cases, I know, but they reflect very well on how law is limited to political communities and therefore how wide is the space of authorities to discriminate on, on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, classical immigrants, guest workers, and refugees are all dominated by state authorities, uh, if, if we take seriously the re Republican viewpoint, because, because the, the fate of these people are, are large, is largely dependent on sexism and racism uh, of authorities. Moreover, we have to note that even second and third generation immigrants are exposed to stigmatization and ghettoization. Freedom of uh, refugees, on the other hand, are actively restricted by authorities in, uh, in refugee camps, and they are totally dependent on the benevolence of state officers. The second reason that makes uh, republicanism an attractive approach to migration is that in spite of liberalism's focus on justice, it focuses on injustice. This makes republicanism capable of focusing on the most vulnerable persons. It also creates an opportunity to examine systematic injustices and to address the unfair dynamics of border controls and refugee camps. The, the focus on injustice is called for the importance of status. So for the Republican, the most uh, important status is where the individual can look, the individuals can look into each other's eyes and they, they, don't, they do not need to bow in front of others. Although, thank you. Although, although this status is provided best by citizenship, a fundamental demand for our Republican theory of migration might be the recognition of uh, citizenship-like rights or for the most vulnerable people. Therefore, republicanism forces us to take the viewpoint of people on the move, women and even children, seriously. 
The third advantage of, uh, of a Republican approach is its radicalism toward ex existing uh, social institutions. Although, although Republicanism is more skeptical than its liberal contemporaries about institutions, it is at the same time less skeptical about the, the possibility of, of their correction by the state. Uh, supporting this claim, Pettit himself argues that Republican freedom is an open idea that can be uh, attractive for even radical movements. And I believe that on the same, same basis, um, Republicanism leaves us the room to formulate claims uh, from the part of the most dominated persons or, or groups. And finally, the fourth reason of, of the attractiveness of this uh, approach is the possibility of a consensus between society, because according to Petit, interests uh, that influence state decisions must be objectionable from any part of the society. Uh, and in, in the case of migration, I think it means that uh, we can identify other relevant forms of domination beyond the, the already mentioned the typologies like the slave master slave relationship. So, for example, we can identify the uh, citizen and non citizen relationship, the relationship between authorities and migrants. And uh, this perspective also uh, forces us to highlight the importance of questions such as where do border control in fact happen? Because we know that it, is not, it does not happen exactly at the territorial border and of the state and, and not always at the moment of the entrance. Um, so as concluding, I would like to uh, argue that republicanism gives us a new conceptual framework to address both migration and, and its re related phenomena. Uh, however, I wouldn't like to say that uh, political theory of migration should be either liberal or republican. Rather, I would like to think that republicanism offer some prosperous ideas to which current discussion may or might turn to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Wielaki, for your presentation. I do very much appreciate a theoretically oriented study and, and paper. So this was very, very interesting for me um, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fourth presenter in this uh, panel is Miss Ranjana Kumari. Um, uh, exactly. The National Medical College in Nepal. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, she will present a paper on the socioeconomic effects of COVID 19 on English learners in Nepal. Ms. Kumarija, uh, I know, I'm not sure if you're a doctor or Ms. Miss. Okay. Because I do not want to uh, not call people doctor when they are a doctor. I've made that mistake before. So you okay. may begin your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, warm greetings to all. It's me, Ranjana Kumari Cha. I'm from Nepal. And then today we all know that we are all human beings are facing challenging eras due to the COVID-19 that in this situation we see especially in my country I saw that most of the students they are uh, shelling fruits and then vegetable on the street and most of the students they don't take class regular classes through the online so in my mind it comes that I have to do the research and then I carry out my research and then uh, I, when I start my research, then I first put up my topic as because we know that COVID-19 directly affects that socio-economical aspects of the English learners. We all know that without economical that the status that we cannot live in the world. So I want to share my that PowerPoint to show you all my research that whatever I have. John. 
So the, my topic is that, as you all know that, the socio-economical effects of COVID-19 on English learners in Nepal. And then, so first, I want to uh, show you the introductions that, as you all know that the COVID-19 pandemic is the first and foremost a health crisis. And then uh, it is a new virus because no previous the vaccines are matching for the process of preventing. According to the reviews, similarly, that Nicole Etienne, that he also, they, they said that COVID-19, it effects in all aspects of our life, as we see it as the, in the form of social, that why that COVID-19 effects? Because of the social distancing, quarantine, lockdown, these all features of the COVID-19, it effects in all aspects of our life. And then so I first uh, made the objective of my topic that as the purpose of my this paper is to address how COVID-19 affects socioeconomic on English learners in Nepal. So as I told you that the purpose of my study is that to address how COVID-19 affects socioeconomic on English learners in Nepal. For this purpose, I have followed the, some methodology and for that, I have uh, selected 50 students from 25 and 25 from the two community schools and four teachers from each two community schools. And then main tool for my study was that questionnaire and then interview through the online. And then responses of my research also, as I'm showing here, the responses of students I found as differently as you can also see here that 85% uh, students that they are selling fruits, vegetables on the estate because of losing the father's job. Okay, similarly, 70% students, they or parents force them to help them to maintain hands and mouth problems. As we can guess here that due to the COVID-19, that most of the parents pushes the learners to help them to maintain the hands and mouth problems. Similarly, 75% students, they don't take online classes because of the lack of the, that the money, they don't have money, so they cannot afford the net pack. They don't have a smart mobile. They don't have the laptop. So due to such a reason, they don't take always online classes. Similarly, as the result, what we see that according to the response of students, that 80% students, their speaking skill is not good. Why? Because as you know that due to the COVID-19, that in our country, there was this, uh, still now to it is the system that uh, curfew, lockdown, isolation, and then lack of the friend circles, they could not get the expose, exposure. As a result, they could not get time to do the practice for the speaking skill. So we found that students' speaking is not good as like that the previous time. So this is also the responses of the students. Similarly, I got the responses of the teachers too. I see the responses of teachers. As my research saw that, 85% teachers said that learners or uh, they face they easily divert towards the social events activities. Why? Because lack of the that the economical power or lack of the economical that the facilities they could not see or the, that the scarcities of the families. So whoever they motivate or they offer for some. Or so bad social activities, then easily the students they dive hard towards there. Similarly, that I also got the response from the teachers that seventy percent teachers responded that learners involve the activities of working, of laboring working, and farming working. Why? Because of the lack of the scarcity of the monies that scarcity of the daily needed things. 
And then parents, or as well as the others relative persons, they forces the children to involve in the activities of the farming and then activities of the working as a laboring. Similarly, we see that 80% that the teachers responded that learners are dull due to the social problems and due to the long gapping of the learning activities. As you know that due to the COVID-19, all schools and colleges, universities remain closed. And as a result, the students, uh, they could not get the chance of the learning. Their learning is not continuous. As a result, they face the situation of the long gapping of the learning. So their mind, their lag is not functioning well. So they come on the position of the, that they became as a dull. As I said to you that because of the long gapping and then uh, different social problems too, like quarrels in the home, uh, domestic violence, that blah, blah. There are many more problems. Similarly, we see that 65% students that, I mean to say that 65% teachers respond to that. Students, they commit suicides too. Why? Then we guess and we assume that the main reason is that some students, they could not see the more scarcity of the families. And some that students, they could not see the inequality in education. As a who belongs from the rich family, they easily mention all the things. So their friends, they get the chance to the learning, but whereas some students, they could not get the chance because of lack of the money. So the students, they could not tolerate this inequality. As the result, they, they are psychologically, they became very poor and they compelled to do the comic society. So the, in my research, I found such uh, issues that uh, then what I do from this, my issues, as I got the responses, and then I go from, with the help of these responses, I uh, found out some of my findings too. As in my findings, my findings shows that students, they uh, don't take regular online classes. As I told you, due to the lack of money, most of students have compulsions to sell fruits, vegetables, on the estate due to the scarcity during COVID-19. Similarly, my thought that students speaking skill is not good due to the lack of friend circles and exposure. Similarly, I found my another things too. A students easily divert towards social evil activities due to the shortage of the daily needed things. My finding also shows one thing too, that more students are drop out their education because of the lack of the net back, mobile, and lecture. Similarly, overall, my statistical analysis proved that the great effect of socioeconomic of COVID-19 on English learners in all. Then, uh, similarly, we see that what are the pedagogical implications of my studies? Then I want to show you here that my study also shows the some pedagogical implications too. As the first, the my study contributes to getting more knowledge about the effect of COVID-19 of social economic on English learners. Similarly, it provides knowledge that government should be allowed and make a strict policy to prohibit students to sell fruits, vegetables on the way and take a big action for learning the language skills. Similarly, that it also highlighted basic knowledge to sort out that the socio-economical problems by providing free laptop and mobile, internet for a study, and foods for, and needed things for the life. Similarly, we see this my study raises the awareness and provides the feedback to local and central policy makers, governments, and concerning the stakeholders too. So this is my uh, pedagogical implications that uh, every concerning people should know with the help of my studies too. Similarly, I want to show you and then share 
my that the videos to just five oh, minutes okay thanks for okay i want to show you some videos too regarding that how the children are sharing or be selling fruits and then they are selling vegetable on the street too we can easily see that so please watch it for I don't think we can see the video. Um, we can only hear the sound. Sound is not going over there. We can we can hear, but we cannot see. Oh, yes. Now. Are you hearing? Are you watching? Yeah, yes, you can we can see. Okay, thank you. So, lack of, lack of our time, I could not show you the whole full videos of here. Then similarly, uh, we see different issues are over there. So, uh, I also saw a few minutes, the one image too, where we see that how the moms and then one child, they are hanging over due to the lack of the money too. Or we can say the, there is directly seriously effect of the economical effects upon that. So we see here too. Wait. Okay, let's see here. Are you getting this to all? Are you watching here? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, oh, yes, please. So thank you to all to listen to me carefully and have a patience. Thanks to all. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Ms. Ranjana Kumari Ja. I thank was you. not expecting this uh, last image. I was quite shocked. But uh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's really important for uh, the academic community to talk about the unforeseen consequences of a pandemic. I was yeah, particularly course. surprised with the teacher's answer uh, regarding their prediction of the student's suicide. So this was incredibly eye-opening. So thank you. Um, so next we have our final presenter, Mr. Samuel Alexei Sorokin from the European University uh, Institute in Florence. Um, Hello. Can you hear me? Construction of an inclusive Eurasian cultural identity. We can hear you, thank you, and you may begin your presentation. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, I will just uh, quickly set the, the time so I can follow it. Um, so, good evening everyone, and thank you very much for having me here um, and giving me the opportunity to share a part of my research with you. Uh, the project of Russian Islam as a component of an Eurasian cultural identity. And uh, today I would like to touch on a project in the making, so to speak, contested but uh, growing in relevance, namely the modification of a reformist Islamic school of thought, Jadidism, which has its roots in late 19th century, early 20th century Tatarstan into an important Islamic exegesis, which certain scholars have labeled Russian Islam or Euro-Islam uh, or simply neo jadidism This paper presents one of the several showcases I used to support the principal argument of my dissertation that Islam marginalized sidelines of national debates on identity to its very center, becoming one of the two pillars of the currently constructed and propagated uh, Eurasian meta-identity, which 
by definition is uh, more inclusive, multi-ethnic and plurireligious. So uh, at the end of communism uh, and during the perestroika years in the 19, early 1990s, Islam was essentially considered an appendage, an inheritance of Russia's diverse imperial and colonial endeavors, but uh, barely understood in its uh, contemporary internal post-Soviet dynamics. Most experts, with the exception of a few, thought of the topic as basically irrelevant for the general post-Soviet vectors of development. And it would be fair to say that behind the background of political chaos, economic crisis, and state erosion uh, following the first decade after the Perestroika, the Kremlin basically set other priorities. Yeltsin's famous phrase has been emblematic for those years when he said, take as much sovereignty as you can swallow. And most republics sure did. Um, large concessions in autonomous rights were bargained in exchange for remaining in the newly formed Russian Federation. In Moscow, meanwhile, Slavocentric nationalism and the strengthening of the Russian Orthodox Church as the principal standard bearer of the nation's post-Soviet rebirth gave um, equally little attention to the ethno-religious processes that were taking place in Tatarstan, Bashkirtostan, or the Northern Caucasus. In this time of religious laissez-faire, the vacant role of the state was substituted by foreign states and external Islamic movements that could proliferate and proselytize outside of administrative control. During this phase, each Muslim-dominated republic was engulfed in its own project of nation building, uh, post-Soviet identity formation and Islamic uh, revival. And it is during this time as well that we can observe radical Islamism entering the religious market, which has not been controlled abroad. But this is not to say, however, that the expansion of Salafi ideology in Russia does not also have domestic roots among which the utter economic neglect, the investment backlog, um, rampant corruption, unemployment, and clan mentality uh, in certain regions of the North Caucasus, which gave a certain countercultural allure to radical Islamic ideologies, especially in the eyes of the disillusioned youth. Now, this period of political indifference and uh, analytical incapacity of the administration to grasp inner Islamic processes that were to eventually came to an end uh, uh, in, the early, in the early 2000s. With Putin's first presidency, the process of recentralization back of the federal, um, of the federal republic's sovereignty rights, uh, which they have uh, accumulated in the 1990s, uh, had been initiated, and it is of the government's attempt to uh, regain a foothold in the inner Islamic discourses themselves. As I see it, two primary threats, the territorial separatism on the one hand and the uh, Islamic radicalism on the other, primary reasons for the government to treat the so-called Islamic question as a fundamental aspect of national security and basically uh, Russia's statehood. First, governmental institutions began uh, bringing back in line the Islamic spiritual boards. Spiritual boards being centralized umbrella organizations that administer regional Islamic structures. So um, administrative pressure curtailed the influence of foreign states and established new mechanisms uh, which overviewed the relation between Islamic spiritual boards and foreign Islamic organizations. The foundation of Islamic nation, for instance, which was established in 2006, became a central organ to finance and control the Hajj, so the, the pilgrimage from Russia to Islamic holy sites. Uh, within a short time of four years, eight new Islamic universities were established, each of them in a partnership with a major secular um, state university. New directives uh, administered 
the, uh, dominist, uh, the, 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 the domestic training of religious scholars and the Islamic spiritual boards were delegated the role of pushing back the influence of the Hanbali school of jurisprudence, which was considered to be fundamentalist and uh, foreign to the tradition of Russia's Muslims. Last but not least, we see in this period as well the establishment of uh, new structures between the Russian Orthodox Church and Islamic organs for a durable collaboration. Part of the Islamic Renaissance in post-communist Russia was the discovery and the further development of Jadidism of the early 20th century, which I have mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. For one, Jadidism uh, in late 19th, early 20th century was an educational reformist movement, which um, tried to complement traditional Islamic education by the introduction of natural science, human science, uh, the teachings of Russian, Tatar, Ottoman, Turkish, and Farsi languages. But above all, it was also a profound religious philosophical school of thought, uh, which aspired to synthesize Islam with intellectual traditions of the West, and uh, Jadidist theorists searched to reconcile the, the Sharia with the lived realities of the modern world. But at the peak of its intellectual creativity, the Bolshevik Revolution put an abrupt end to Jadidism, just as it did to, the, to Russia's rich Islamic life in general. It remained, however, a central point of departure for, um, contemporary, for contemporary reformist concepts of today. Since Jadidism was the first thorough intellectual endeavor to merge Islamic identity with a broader, with a broader Russian civic identity, a project which in doing so basically deconstructed dichotomic subdivisions into colonizer or colonized, modern or exoticized, and challenged the oriental which Islam could not incorporate a uh, progressive spirit. On the other hand, however, the project faced critique of mimicry and uh, 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 of the willingness to submit itself to a process of russification for the sake of integration, at the end of which, critiques argued, the uh, genuine Islamic tradition risked to be dissolved in some sort of homogenizing modernity. Now, since the early 1990s, this concept was, uh, of Jadidism was resumed and declared by Tatar nationalists to form the very backbone of the new Tatar nation's ideology. But with the significant withdrawal of sovereignty rights by the end of the 2000s, neo jadidism tried to reconfigure it itself into a Russian Islam, a certain uh, uh, panacea ideology which could unite the fragmented Muslim experiences within Russia and at the same time serve as a certain theological prophylaxis of religious communities against fundamentalism and radicalism. In the early 20th century, uh, Jadidism's prominent theorist Ismail Gasprinsky viewed Muslim life as joined through faith with the fate of greater Russia. He argued that through Russia as a cultural mediator, Western culture could uh, reach and enrich Islamic discourses and assist Russian Muslims in fundamentally reforming Islam. And already in its early stages, the idea the idea included the historical cultural dimension, which is very interesting in the context of Eurasian, of Eurasian uh, uh, ideology. Uh, it uh, said that Turkic ethnicities of the Eurasian plains had a spiritual predisposition to present to the world a moderate, tolerant, and self-reflecting Islam. So the principal argument went that influenced by the intercultural exchange over centuries with the Khorezm Empire in Central Asia as part of uh, the Silk Road and the Pax Mongolica. Uh, 
as being in contact with Persian, Jewish Khazar, and of course the Russian Orthodox cultures, the very genesis of Islam in the Volga Ural territories, which are populated by uh, uh, Turkic ethnicities and uh, which began in the ninth century, took place in a culturally and religiously far more diverse context than in other Muslim regions of the Ummah. So this five, is- Five minutes, sorry. Thank you. So um, this historical precondition of synthesizing and merging different cultures while remaining faithful to the values of Islam, Tatar intellectuals argued, discloses a particular raison d'être, a certain hidden universal sense, a mission entailed upon Russia's Muslims. Uh, now, contemporary scholars try to reconnect this idea of a certain Muslim mission uh, uh, and engage in merging this mission with uh, a certain topoi of Russia's Christian religious philosophy. Now, in Russian religious philosophy of the early 19th and early 20th century, which was again strongly based on orthodox eschatological concepts, there exists a similar understanding of a divine providence. Um, considering itself a God-carrying nation, Narod Baganosets, uh, Russia's mission, according to Slavophil thinkers, was to overcome the fragmentation of humanity and recreate all unity, uh, This fragmentation, Christian religious philosophers argued, resulted from the false value systems established by the European uh, Enlightenment, whose principal outcome they considered to be a collective despiritualization and a hyper-rationalization of the human nature, which essentially disconnects humanity from its divine teleological purpose as envisioned by the creator. So uh, contemporary neo jedidism duplicates the notion of this messianism and directs it towards the global Islamic community. So if the dominance of reason in European philosophical thought prevents humanity from reconnecting with God, then an erroneously understood Islam prevented Muslim societies from reconnecting with contemporary processes of modernity and becoming an essential contributor to it. So uh, I argue that the synthesis of those two missions in turn serves as an affirmation of Russia's Eurasian spirit, which has developed as a result of a millennium of Islamic Christian coexistence. So Russia's idiosyncratic history as standing between Asia and Europe, the argument goes, allows it to tackle the two greatest challenges those two civilizations currently face. On the one hand, the postmodern epistemology of moral relativism, ethic whateverism, and uh, the deconstruction of traditional value systems to remain in their rhetoric. And on the other hand, the threat of radical Islamism and fundamentalism which lacks the conceptual tools to, um, to overcome the seeming contradiction between religious normative order and contemporary modernity. So as a last sentence, uh, this fusion of reformist Islam with certain neo-Slavophile um, neo concepts uh, results in Russia self-prescribing itself the role of a moderate gold middle so to speak, the beacon of intercultural and interreligious stability, which is predestined to um, balance out the two extremes, which are postmodernist and religious radicalism. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was very enlightening, very, um, the Russian position is very reminiscent of the, uh, you know, Mackinders of this life, geopolitical, views where Russia is the heartland. So really, really interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we now have a brief amount of time for questions and answers. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, I managed to collect some questions posed by the audience and, and other panel members, um, as well as my own questions. So I'd like to ask one to two questions per participant. Uh, and I ask that uh, you be very, very brief in your answer so that all can uh, answer. Um, and I'll start with 
uh, Dr. Felice, uh, I have uh, two questions. Um, so one is, is uh, my own question. Uh, did you engage with postmodernist literature uh, despite, I know, uh, criticism by Mr. Sorkin. We've, we've, uh, uh, we, we understand that uh, not everybody likes postmodernism. Um, uh, po but I, I ask this because uh, there's a, an inescapable semiotic aspect to your study, uh, Dr. Felice, uh, that I think could benefit from this engagement with uh, um, maybe, you know, uh, Michael Shapiro's work or other postmodernists uh, interested in this area. Uh, and also we have another question from Ms. Uh, Hatis Yazgan, uh, directed at Dr. Feliz. Um, regarding your case, France, how does Europe make a difference in, term, in terms of the demands and backgrounds uh, of the protesters, uh, especially compared with other cases? And now I have questions, uh, a question for Dr. Chowdhury. Um, and again, this question has a lot to do with my own research interests. Um, so in your experience in knowledge as a scholar, um, do you think that it is possible for Belarus to ever replace this Russian sphere of influence uh, currently uh, with a European Union sphere of influence and, and eventually request the European Union for membership? And Ms. Hatis Yezgan asks similarly uh, in the same line, uh, apart from the sanctions uh, issue, which is at stake now with these uh, uh, protests, uh, what, what could the EU offer to Belarus in the framework of the so-called Eastern Partnership uh, within the European Neighborhood Policy uh, of the EU? And then I have a question for uh, Ms. Uyilaki. Uh, as I said, I really appreciate a theoretically oriented study uh, or presentation in this case. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is something that interests you, uh, but I wonder if you uh, engaged when you were preparing your study, if you engaged on literature on securitization of migration. Uh, I know Barry Buzan uh, with the original concept. More recently, we have Corey Robinson, Christopher Beaker uh, Bell, uh, for example. Uh, so I don't know, uh, did you uh, encounter, was it interesting for you, securitization uh, literature? And uh, we have um, also a question uh, from uh, Dr. Chowdhury for Ms. Ranjana Kumari Jha. Uh, you, argue that, you argue that the Nepali state uh, ought to provide uh, for students' needs, including food and technology, to mitigate the effects of the pandemic and allow them to focus on their studies. Um, but to what extent is the Nepali state capable of actually implementing a program of the scope? And if not the state, the state who else could uh, eventually step in? And uh, finally, we have uh, a couple of questions for Mr. Sorokin. Uh, my own question uh, is, uh, well, postmodernist related, I apologize. <laughs> um, I have this tendency. I think it's actually a really useful tool for questioning. Maybe not, you know, it's not very normative uh, at all. It's, it's problematic in that aspect, but I think it's, it's really interesting for questioning. So my question is, in addition to identities, you, you mentioned discourse and narratives, uh, particularly in your, um, uh, the text that you provided us, the, the abstract. So I wonder what kind of method methodology you used. I'm myself impartial to discourse, and well, critical discourse analysis with its uh, more postmodernist inclination, like to look at representations, the deconstruction of power symmetries, uh, genealogy, uh, so those sort of, of tools. And I also have uh, another question, Mr. Sorokin, uh, asked by Dr. Uh, Chowdhury. Uh, to what extent is neo jadidism transferable from the Volga Ural area to the Northern Caucasus? Uh, has it found any takers in places like Chechnya or Dagestan? So thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, each um, participant to very briefly uh, ask, uh, answer the questions. I'd say like 10 minutes, uh, uh, if possible, maximum, very, very maximum each. And uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Feliz uh, so that we can just use the same order. Uh, I, I hope that Dr. Feliz is still. Yes, I am. Can you? Okay, good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I will start with um, Dr. Hatice Yazgan's question, if you allow me. Uh, so, um, actually, all the questions are uh, great. So many thanks, and also for uh, making me uh, think more, thinking more. 
Actually, um, when we think the colonial history in Indonesia and then uh, oppression um, and informal um, actors like ISIS um, in Iraq, um, um, the exploitation and oppression uh, can uh, have different tools. Um, but um, I mean, comparing with Europe, I mean, um, but the uh, protests in, in France also, uh, I think, unite uh, with these protests um, with respect to the day of being uh, against economic and, and, and political privileges of the elites. So um, what I uh, try to present in confrontation uh, to market-driven uh, conception of social justice um, there I mentioned about five uh, categories of uh, oppression and um, I really believe and also I think that um, in these five categories of, of, of oppression all these protesters uh, unite um, between themselves um, because let's for example think about exploitation like uh, power status um, power status and wealth of uh, capitalist class are constantly increasing but no matter where it is affecting the um, most disadvantaged people and also um, creation, creating and structuring us and others are also effective in the same way in almost all societies. Like for example, violence exists in Iraq in different forms and in Indonesia in different forms, but also we, are talk we should talk about the homophobic violence and also sexist violence which uh, exists also in Europe. So, um, what people or, or what some people face um, becomes or, or is becoming common in, in global society. And also with respect to the European Union, of course, European Union has emerged as a um, promoter of global values and so on and so forth. So we maybe expect France uh, um, to be a little bit different. Um, but what people is against, actually, also against uh, European Union is, um, policies, because uh, if we compare the uh, social policies that European Union promotes and social policies in France, then we can see that French social policies, French social protection mechanisms are much more developed than what EU is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. Um, so, and also another important point is that, um, from my understanding, the protesters um, do not consider the European Union as an actor to negotiate, or they don't go to, they don't uh, go to European Union to, uh, or they don't address to European Union to, for their uh, demands. Um, I think this is. I I, I hope I responded to your uh, question. And then I go through the this postmodernist approach. Um, actually, it, is, it wasn't uh, really a question. I mean, it's just uh, if if you did engage in that literature. Um, yes, for sure. And also, again, this confrontation to market driving conception, uh, I think, has lots of similar um, similar uh, characteristics with postmodernist point of view, uh, because in the social justice uh, literature there is a uh, domination of, uh, for example, redistribution. Like all terrorists are saying that if we redistribute the resources or redistribute whatever, then we can reach a fair society. But then um, this conception, confrontation to market driven conception, rejects uh, to accept this as a reality. So they created another reality. So um, I think um, this fits in it. Um, I think that's all for my part. I don't want to. Make it Thank you. That was really interesting. Maybe a critical theory might be more in line. But anyway, this is um, another debate. Um, so, Dr. Chowdhury, uh, um, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, two very good questions about about what role the EU can have uh, now and in the more distant future. So, first, to address uh, Hatice Hoja's question about what um, the EU can do now uh, beyond sanctions. Um, what it can offer uh, is two things, really. One is uh, to serve as a as a uh, mediator or as a platform for mediation, just the way that Belarus did actually under Lukashenko uh, in 2014 um, with regard to talks between Ukraine and Russia, because as I mentioned, uh, it was the only sort of 
territory seen as neutral enough uh, for such talks to be held in. Now, uh, in its turn, uh, the EU can try to negotiate between the opposition movement and Lukashenko uh, as an honest broker. Uh, the problem being that Lukashenko is very unlikely to accept the EU or its member states as honest brokers. And for the opposition, Russia has no credibility whatsoever as, um, as a mediator. Uh, Russia did play that role in 1996 and saved Lukashenko from impeachment, following which he dissolved the parliament and actually assumed dictatorial power. So that is, the opposition is not going to allow that to be repeated. Uh, but um, the proposal that uh, two of uh, Belarus's member, uh, rather Belarus's neighbors, uh, Latvia and Lithuania, have come up with is that new elections uh, be held in the very near future. Uh, the, the results of the current or the, the elections that happened in August be scrapped, and that both Lukashenko and representatives of the opposition be allowed to take part in these new elections. To which Lukashenko said, sure, you can organize new elections, but you have to kill me first. These were his little words, which means that, you know, that is not going to happen. What Lukashenko is suggesting is that he modify the constitution following Putin's proposal and that he hold new elections in two years time, which is unacceptable to the opposition. The, the, the other thing that, that the EU has been doing, uh, because it, its role as a mediator, as I said, has been very limited uh, for force um, because of Lukashenko's refusal to accept them. What it also has been doing is, um, uh, trying to aid the opposition in the ways that it, it can. Uh, of course, the opposition right now is not party-led, it's, it's really quite amorphous. Uh, so it, it, the, several EU members have been helping both the movement as a whole and particular figures. So for example, Tikhanovska, the, the opposition uh, candidate in the presidential election, uh, whom the op opposition believes to be the winner, the actual winner of the election, has found uh, political asylum uh, uh, and refuge in Lithuania. Um, other opposition figures have found refuge in Poland, uh, and, and Poland announced actually just today or yesterday that it is willing to take in more Belarusian refugees, uh, should the need arise. Uh, Germany, um, about two or three days ago, argued the case uh, for Lukashenko to be condemned uh, for his actions uh, against the protesters by the UN Human Rights Council. So there has been individual action by individual member states, the ones that Germany has a very strong trading relationship with the EU, which is why it's interested. Um, um, and uh, of course, Poland and Latvia and Lithuania are immediate neighbors of Belarus. Uh, with regard to Dr. Ribeiro's question uh, about a change in mentality, that is of course a more long-term process. Um, there was a poll conducted uh, just in February, before the pandemic really hit, um, uh, changing the whole news agenda in, in both Belarus and the world. In February, people were asked, and, and this question is posed by Belarusian pollsters very uh, frequently, but they were asked uh, if there was a dichotomous choice between entering the EU or integrating further with Russia, in other words, making this union state concept more real, if there was this choice, which side would people favor? And 32% of Belarusians said they would support joining the EU versus 40% who favored closer integration with, with Russia. Um, based, on, based on my previous readings, I would say that uh, the younger somebody is, the more urban they are, and the more uh, uh, sort of uh, the extent to which they live in Minsk or another one of the big cities, the more likely they are to favor joining the EU. Um, and uh, you know, support for uh, closer integration with Russia uh, tends to decline uh, over time. There were times when it was closer to 60%. Um, furthermore, uh, Belarus is actually the highest per capita recipient of Schengen visas in the world. I mean, Belarusians do get upset that they are required to get Schengen visas at all, uh, but, but they are, uh, and, 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 and they do at higher rates than anybody else. Uh, they largely tend to travel to those same neighboring countries or even and when they do, they find um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, countries that are culturally and historically very close to Belarus. Belarus used to be part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you know, for centuries. Uh, so there is that shared history, but at the same time, those countries are fairly democratic, I mean, perhaps less so than countries like Germany, but, but much, much more so than, than Belarus. Um, and uh, on top of that, they are more economically su successful. Uh, what Lukashenko always points to is, is Russia, with which Belarus has approximately the same standard of living, or Ukraine, 
which looks disastrous compared to Belarus. But what Belarusians traveling to the EU look at is uh, living standards in, in, in Poland or, or, or Lithuania, not to mention you know, countries uh, further to the West. So I think the long-term trajectory, particularly if Lukashenko does exit the scene now and the opposition is successful in taking power, which is not guaranteed, if it were to happen, I think that the long-term trajectory for Belarus will be to beat a path towards EU membership. The trick is doing it without provoking Russian intervention, the way that Ukraine's very tentative moves towards potential EU membership in the future uh, actually provoked the annexation of Crimea to some extent in 2014. So the trick is to avoid that and to move very gradually without sort of uh, without completely breaking down the relationship with Russia, simply because Belarus cannot afford to do it. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, as an individual, as a citizen, hoping that the like Lukashenko falls. Anyway, I just had to Thank say you. it. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, Miss uh, Ulyaki, um, your answer, please. Uh, thank you, thank you for your recommendation, uh, Dr. Riberio, for for addressing the securitization literature. I was not familiar with it because I'm more into the ethical part of the topic of migration than I am. But now, as I had some uh, a couple of minutes to to just have a look on the literature, I realized that it is very important for me because. My main concepts are uh, care ethics and vulnerability. So, so it is it is a very useful idea. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. It's just also an interest of mine. That's why I, I oh. thought of suggesting. Okay. But thank you. I, I don't. Thank I don't you. think I have any uh, further questions uh, for you. This was just yeah. the yeah. the you. one uh, question, and I have uh, those those questions that I mentioned for Ms. Ranjana Kumari Ja if uh, she's still here yes the... oh okay good thank you okay. so if you could uh, answer thank you very much oh welcome for asking question dr Zodhi. thanks for asking question uh, we all know that nepali state or the government of the nepal is not possible for them to maintain the free of uh, that uh, technology and food store but i think it's not impossible to because we all know that Every for problems, they brings the solution. We all know that. If there is no solution, it means that is not a real problem. Real problem means that must be the solution. So if we, uh, we use the tricks, then of course we can sort out the problems. And as we also know that if there is a will, then there, will, there is a that the way to. We can must find out. As the result, uh, as of now, our government has taken the stick action now from this month as a most of the government teachers they are going in the field collecting the data that how many students are there uh, means their schools students they are collecting the data and they are managing that the uh, uh, online taking teaching that the one team and with the help of that team they start their teachings too and uh, this for this the government has given the free net pack so I think, uh, Dr. Saudri, you can see that as this my research I have done, and then in one that uh, you know that the that the meeting I expressed these views in front of the experts too, and I think they heard my that ideas. I don't say in my ideas only one, but most of the people they also think that it's, it is the only one the solution as a current time demands it, and as the result the government has given the sum that the net pack free to the school teachers and school teachers they use the free net and they are teaching their students so this solution now our government from this month they are using so i think this is a possible and another one is that as you ask question who will take then as i told you that if we are more and more hands together then of course we solve the problems so as we think that as our in our countries that local government and central government, if they both uh, make together the trick real to solve the problem of this one, then of course I hope and I believe that as to we can sort out such type of the problems. But uh, mostly that our intentions should be the pure. Our intentions 
you know, our mentality should be the pure. So I think some responsibilities and details should distribute through the local governments too. If the local government, they take that responsibility as purely, as really, without any crops and without any other thing else, then of course I feel we can solve these problems too. So I hope you get the answer of your questions too. If you have any other questions, you can ask. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Ranjana Kumari Ja. And we move to Thank Mr. You. Sorokin and my postmodernist question. <laughs> Okay, uh, so thank you very much for uh, uh, really two wonderful questions, uh, both on postmodernism and on the Northern Caucasus. Uh, I will start with uh, uh, I will start with um, my um, methodological approach. So um, now only focused on the uh, uh, Russian, so ethnic Russian or uh, uh, religious Russian discourse. Um, I. I uh, uh, follow the transformation of the idea of Europe um, in the discourse, which uh, goes all the way back from the late 18th, early 19th century, where the idea prevailed that Europe is gradually entangling itself in, uh, uh, because of a certain over-evaluation of reasoning, uh, where it uh, gets, um, lost in, a, in an intellectual experiment, which gets more and more abstract from the spiritual beginning, which is the divine beginning uh, um, of the human nature, similarly to Descartes, uh, uh, to, to Descartes' ontological, uh, uh, um, ontological proof of God's existence, which has no spiritual component to it. So actually this idea that, uh, the, that those are the dark sides of, uh, of European enlightenment. Now that we are uh, talking about a certain dialectic relation between Russian conservative thinkers and uh, what they consider uh, European postmodernism, in the Russian narrative, it is just a continuation of that very experiment which started during the European enlightenment. So what we now see within Russian uh, uh, interpretation is that this European epistemology reached its dead end and uh, uh, that this is precisely the culmination which uh, actually Russian philosophical tradition has been uh, uh, writing about over the um, course of the past uh, one, one and a half years in its intellectual interaction and exchange with Europe. So I do uh, uh, try to recreate those uh, uh, discursive continuities. So what elements drop off, what elements uh, are uh, rediscovered uh, once in the Perestroika era, um, contemporary Russian uh, theorists rediscovered for themselves uh, the, the, the great emigre literature uh, uh, which was for 80 years basically not part of the discourse. Mm, so from Solovyov through Bitskoy to Berdyaev and uh, uh, Ilyin. And what I then do, I try to contrast this uh, constructed imaginary of the West with certain continuities within the uh, inner Islamic discourse. Again, first of all, in, uh, uh, within Russia, mm, and then uh, uh, in the broader context of the the global Ummah. So um, what certain imaginaries of the West as they are debated, constructed, debated, and uh, 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 compared uh, to in the Islamic narrative um, are contradicting or actually show commonalities with the inner Russian discourse. And it's out of this that I try to merge those, uh, 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 those parallels into, into a broader Eurasian, Eurasian idea. Mm, I don't know if I have sufficiently answered the, the, the first question. Um, good, so um, now to the question of uh, um, Dr. Chavduri, thank you very much. So that is, that would be actually the end of my, of my presentation uh, uh, if I would have had more time, of course, uh, uh, because that is precisely the, 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 the example, the lechmos test, so to say, where the concept of Russian Islam reaches its limits. 
because as I tried to um, vaguely mention the, 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 the Tatar experience uh, of coexisting over centuries with the Slavic Orthodox uh, ethnicities uh, or being that, that uh, intermediary in the, uh, on the Silk Road is just one of the many experiences which may allow such a narrative to be constructed. But if we look at the um, Northern Caucasus, basically, the, the, the spread of Islam, the true uh, anchoring of Islam in the Caucasus societies corresponded precisely to one to the one century of uh, the, the, the Gazavat, the religious war against uh, Russian imperial expansion. And the heroes of the North Caucasian resistance, um, Haji Murad, for example, or Imam Shamil, have been Islamic scholars or uh, Imams themselves. So what we see here is a certain, uh, certain conflict of uh, memory cultures. Uh, in which the, the North Caucasian memory culture and association of the role which Islam had was one of resistance and of opposition, which does not really allow to construct such a narrative of Christian Muslim coexistence as uh, 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 compared to, mm, to the Volga Ural region, which is well, since, since, since uh, actually the, the conquest of the Mongols somehow interconnected with the uh, uh, Muscovy, Muscovy state, with the Slavic Russian state. Uh, so that is the first uh, uh, answer to the, to the question, the, the first half. And the second half quickly would be that um, what one should not forget is that each of the current republics are engaged in an own ethno-religious uh, uh, nation building project, which means that this um, includes a certain homogenization of the discourse of what is to be considered traditional Islam in each of these uh, uh, respective regions. It is the Sufi uh, Naqshbandi Tariqat in Chechnya. It is the attempt of somehow harmonizing Sufi and Salafi uh, movements in uh, multicultural Dagestan. It is uh, in, in, in the Adigean Republic, so kabardino balkaria and karachaevo Cherkessia, we have a focus on the adat, so on the customary law. So what we see is we have diverse projects of Islam and uh, this idea of Russian Islam as being a modern reformist alternative cannot include those different Islamic experience uh, in the Russian context. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sorokin, for your answers. Um, very thorough. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time uh, for more questions as we must terminate our session. Um, I was asked to terminate five minutes earlier if possible, so we're right on time. Um, I'm sure if this were a physical uh, session, we would continue our discussion on to the coffee break. But unfortunately, alas, we're in the digital world now of a pandemic. So thank you so much to all of the participants. Uh, it was really interesting, really engaging uh, uh, to, to everybody who participated as well as the audience. And I hope to see you in future editions of this conference as a participant, as a, a moderator in any capacity. So thank you so much. And I'll see you uh, sometime in the future. <laughs>